and we are going to be con continuing on in the real cause of global warming. And I'm not quite sure. We're on chapter four. And the Great Khan last week left off on page 107. And we're into the point now where we're in some articles. And the articles are dealing with genetic... Uh, the, the, the article that he left off with, or one of the last things that was covered, was the genetically engineered crops. You know, what does that mean? What does that mean? Adulterated and toxic food, bodies, and ecosystems. And, you know, there's... They show here, uh, in that article, it, it shows here, it says that without any scientifically or empirio, empirically verified evidence, advocates of agricultural biotechnology claim that genetic engineered or genetic modified crops are the answer to world hunger and will give security to an ever-increasing population. Okay, the thing to remember about these studies, when these studies are done by individuals or by people, we've got to look at who conducted the study. Who was it that had the study done and who was behind it? Uh, and what do they have to gain from the positive outcome of a study? I can remember when I was in school attending a class and the textbook, it was a, st it was a statistics class that we had. And the title of our textbook was How to Lie with Statistics. Okay, And it went through on how you know, on, on how, and, and it was it was it was on how these things can be manipulated and presented in such a way to make something negative actually appear quite beneficial. Okay, and this is what kind of the things that they do with some of these studies when they when they go in and they're they're talking about these genetically modified organisms, they're genetically modified foods. They're trying to improve. They, they say they improve on what Yahweh created. Go back to the first chapter in Genesis. Everything that Yahweh created was perfect. It was right. It was all beneficial. How can you improve on perfect? How can you improve on right? How can you improve on beneficial? You can't, especially with man's mind, with, 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 with what is going through man's mind. They can't. There is no way. It's impossible to improve on perfect, on beneficial. You can't do it. But they have things to gain behind it. You know, they have the, you know, they, they, they have a stake in the positive outcome. They have a monetary stake in it. And you've got to remember, what was the commission that was given to Adam over the food supply. What was he supposed to do? Praise Yahweh. He was supposed to guard it and to keep it. What is Satan attacking? She's attacking the food supply. Look at what she's doing. She's contaminating and she's defiling the food supply. And what does that do? As we get into these articles, we're going to see that with what she is doing, she's actually contaminating and causing damage to mankind making mankind susceptible to these various diseases. Remember her plan. Her plan is to devastate, is to wipe out mankind. And mankind has fallen right into it. They, they've fallen just like it was in Genesis chapter 3. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same setup there. You know, there you know, mankind has fallen into that same, in, into that same, into that same trap. But throughout this article, you know, it shows that the that there, um, uh, the, the the dangers and stuff that come from these things. On the bottom of page 106, it talks about horizontal gene transfer, and it says it's even likely to take place in the digestive systems pro of protozoa, nematodes, insect larvae, and other soil microorganisms. You know, these things are created and they're in the in the in the soil, in the water, in the air. You know, and they have a function to do. But when they get a hold of these genetic, genetically modified materials, their genetics, their makeup, their DNA also changes. And they cannot do their job as efficiently as they were created, as it was created for them to do. It also shows down here that genes like viruses can infect 
uh, can, in fact, should serve as a warning to us all of the potential risk of transgenetic organisms serving as reservoirs for new diseases and as a medium for the evolution of new pathogens because of their altered physiology and biochemistry. And then it talks about these unanticipated multiple side effects of gene insertion. Mankind has no idea. These scientists, they're the smartest people in the world that they know. You know, but they, you know, they have no idea the complication. They have no idea what goes into and what they're messing with with these when they start inserting these genes. They don't know how it, how, they don't know the side effects. They don't know what else is adversely affected. And we're going to see that here. Yahweh willing, we'll see that here in just a, here in a little bit. Um, we'll see that in a little bit more detail. There on, under number nine, there on page 107, it says, some 99% of commercial transgenetic crops incorporate virus genes, either as promoters or to control virus infections. And the, uh, the idea to control, the idea that these scientists have control over anything, you know, it's a delusion that they have themselves because they have control over nothing. They don't know what they're, they don't really, I mean, they don't have control over these things. They think they do, but they don't. These virus genes can uh, recombine with other viruses and may result in new diseases. It's not that they may, it's that they do. They do result in new diseases and more invasive pathogens. You know, they get more virulent, they get more deadly, they get worse as each mutation takes place. DNA released from, a, from living and dead cells can persist in the environment and be transferred to other organisms. An organism may be dead, but it's naked, but it's naked DNA released from decaying cells may remain biologically active for, a, for potentially thousands of years, especially in certain soils and marine sediments. Vaccines. You know, vaccines are made up of these so-called dead but naked uh, DNA. You know, if you look at the if you look at the at the vial on a um, on a shot for uh, I don't know uh, for that you might give a dog, you'll see down there it says modified vi live virus or modified killed virus. Okay. So I mean yeah, that's that's what they're injecting. They're injecting these things into the bodies, and they just you know you just don't know, you know the you know, the, the danger and stuff that is involved with that. They don't have the control over that that they think that they do. Such naked DNA in the form of, re, uh, in the form of recombinant and modified nucleic acids has been found capable of surviving and remaining functional longer after organisms' deaths than was assumed previously. The instability of transgenetic crops is a major concern. There is, in fact, no data documenting their stability of any transgenetic line in gene expression or structure. So, you know, there's no data, there's no documentation, there's nothing that proves that these things are stable. They're telling you, they, they might tell you that there are, oh, there's nothing that proves, there's nothing that proves that uh, there's any adverse effects. Well, they don't have any proof that it doesn't cause any adverse effects. But look here at this article here on uh, a new strain of norovirus hits hard. And this was in uh, fourth Roman month of 2007. And it shows here, it, it, the article talks about this norovirus, and it's a very common virus it shows. And it shows by the age of four, almost every child has had it in some form. But the virus that hit the Hebrew Senior Life Center was a new strain, stronger and longer lasting the more, uh, and more contagious. In approximately 36 hours, beginning on, on 2:21, the norovirus spread quickly from one unit of five people and uh, to at least three or four others. The virus. Notice how it's transmitted. Notice how this virus is transmitted. The virus is passed from person to person. Notice how, by touch, by coming in contact with somebody, or notice through food. Through food, it's passed through. It, 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 the, a lot of these diseases are either tra passed by person to person through casual contact, through touch, or passed through with food. Remember, remember the warning that Pastor has given us uh, uh, as far as eating out in the world. You know, don't go to these worldly restaurants. Don't don't go to those establishments out there. 
You don't know, I mean, you don't know who's handling your food. You don't know what type of diseases that they have. You don't, you have no idea, but these things are passed. And this is how they're passed from one person to another through the contact, through food. And it shows here the nurses at Senior Life Center quickly found that the hospital germicidals that they had used had no effect. So what they were doing to try to prevent this stuff, they thought that it was working, but it was useless. It wasn't working at all. In the 25 years of practice, Dr. Robert Schreiber, a physician, of the, uh, physician in chief at the Hebrew Senior Life Center, uh, said he had never seen anything so contagious. The bug was the worst we've ever seen in terms of outbreaks, he said. The way it spread, despite the fact that we were prepared for this, demonstrated that we were dealing with something new. It had changed. We have a, we, we've had flu outbreaks here that, com, that were nothing compared to what we experienced here. Major outbreaks of norovirus have been reported nationwide, and at least 60% of the outbreaks that winter were of notice a new strain. You know, so it wasn't the same strain that was popping up, but it was evolving, it was changing. And that's what these, that's what these, that's what these viruses do, they change. I think the Rick Hanyadidia put it as they were like shape changers, I think is the, uh, the term that he used. You know, they change from one form to another. Um, you know, as, a, as antibiotics are used on these different bugs, you know, they're used so much and so often that not all of them are killed and they build up a resistance to it and then they, then they get, uh, then they breed with other and they create these new strains and this is what takes place. This is why we're getting these antibiotic resistant strains. Bacteria thrives in a pesticide environment. It says germs thrive, thrive in certain farm chemicals, the study shows. Pesticides kill insects, but new research suggests that they may be a breeding ground for different kinds of bugs, that is bacteria. Four out of 15 uh, pesticides tested proved to be a very friendly environment for germs that cause human disease. The incidence of illness, illnesses carried by the plants have doubled or tripled in the last decade. Okay? Remember what Yahshua said about the time period that we're living in. You know, that this is going to be a time period like, like nothing, no other that has ever been seen. And we're seeing that with the, the increase in these diseases, with the, with the uh, uh, you know, with how, with, with how deadly and, and how resistant these diseases are. And they showed here, it says, what we found was that in four of those pesticides, including, uh, in, including at least one in each category, the bacteria in 24 hours increased 1,000 fold. So it increased 1,000 times in the time period of 24 hours. If we held it longer, it increased 10,000 fold. And that's, that's a significant increase in the small amount of time, and it surprised us. They had no idea that that's what was going to take place. We're very concerned about the fact that the bacteria grew in these products, but we don't know what the full impact might be. They have no idea. They have no idea what that full impact can be. Now, Pastor shows here, he says the only way disease can jump to mankind is by being part man, and he's taught us that for years. Just as multiple men's seeds and a woman's body creates, mutates, and spreads STDs, bestiality, men with bees, creates bugs that are part animal and part man which can infect man or beast. And the same is true with men defiling birds. And then we see, we're going into the, some articles here about this, about this, uh, about some bird flu here, about bird flu. It says the, in, in, St. Louis here, in St. Louis, it shows here the human risk of being overrun by disease from the animal world, according to researchers who documented 38 illnesses have made that jump, or 38 illnesses have made that jump in the past 25 years. So 38 diseases made the jump from animals, crossed over to where it could infect man and adversely inf affect mankind. 38 in 25 years. It's a little over one virus a year that's made that jump, that's made that, that's made that leap. And the article shows, it says, that's not decent news for the spread of bird flu, which experts fear could mutate and be transmitted easily among people. There are 1,407 pathogens, viruses, bacteria, parasites, protozoa, and fungi that can infect humans. 
That's what they know about. Okay, remember when they show these things, that's what they know about. That's not the ones they haven't discovered yet. That's not the ones that they haven't seen. Of those, 58% come from animals. Scientists consider 177 of the pathogens to be emerging or re-emerging. Humans have always been attacked by novel pathogens. This process has been going on for millennia, but it does seem to be taking place very fast in these modern times, in the last days. When these things, when this time period would increase, when these things would increase. Wohlhouse argues that either many of those diseases or other afflictions will not persist in humans or that there is something peculiar today allowing so many of them to take root in humans. You know, they see that, they see that they're taking place. They know they're making the jump, but they don't understand why. Say, so why is this taking place so fast in modern times? Well, Isaiah 24, verse 5 through 6 shows us why. It says, the earth is also defiled under the inhabitants of it. Why is the earth defiled? Because they, who is, who is they talking about? They're talking about the inhabitants. Because the inhabitants, because they have transgressed the laws, they've changed the ordinances, and they've broken the everlasting covenant. Because of this, the curses devour the earth, and they who dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Remember what, remember what uh, um, I think it's Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 2 says. It says, a curse causeless will not come. And this is what Isaiah is, this is what Isaiah is showing us here, that because, because of this, because these laws have been transgressed, this is why the curse is devouring the earth. And it sounds like AIDS. What science calls HIV AIDS, the scriptures call, the scriptures call an abomination. The word, English word abomination comes from the Hebrew word toaba, and it means something or someone having a sickness or disease that will transfer from that person to someone else. Okay, it's transferable. How an abomination is acquired is simple. And it is outlined for us in the Holy Scriptures. And I love how Pastor, he walks us through this. And it's so, it, he makes it so simple and so easy to understand. He says, it's created by mankind and passed from one person or from one person to, from person to person or from man to animals, birds and fish. It even defiles the soil and the air or the ozone and the firmament. And then Genesis 1, 6 through 8 in the King James Version, we see here that there was a firmament, that Yahweh said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And Yahweh called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And we're told by the inspired prophets that Yahweh's creation is perfect. Remember, it was, it was created perfect. In the beginning, it was perfect. We are also told by the prophets to guard Yahweh's creation. That's our job. To be obedient to the laws of Yahweh. Remember, Pastor, he hit that hard this Sabbath. We're being tested, men, to see if we're going to be obedient. Because it's obedience to the laws of Yahweh that are going to protect Yahweh's creation. That's what the laws are there for. The laws are there to protect and guard. And that's our job, to protect and guard. And we're given the tools to protect and guard. And we have to be willing to follow those same rules in order to protect and guard Yahweh's creation. We're told by the prophets to guard Yahweh's creation, not to mix or change it. What are they doing with the, with the genetic modification? They're mixing it. They're causing confusion. They're breeding confusion. Or otherwise we would bring defilement to ourselves and all creation. Mankind rebelled and the defilement came. See, rebellion brings forth that defilement. The more laws of Yahweh that were broken, the more the defilement grew and the earth became more and the earth and more and, uh, and the more the sickness and disease spread. You know, it compounds. It becomes overloaded. And I've used the analogy before about going through the house and sweeping dirt up underneath the rug. There's only so much dirt you can try to hide underneath that rug before it becomes evident that something's not right. There's something under that rug. And eventually it's all going to spill out. You can only put so much in there before it becomes overwhelmed and everything starts spilling out. 
The prophets also foretold of a major religion of a major religion that would change Yahweh's laws, and it turned out that prophecy was admittedly fulfilled by the Catholic Church, and all religions of the earth follow in that same rebellion today. They admit it. They admitted that in writing that they changed the laws. In writing, they admitted it, signed it, and everything. You know, in fact, if you go back to the to the book to the booklet on the Sabbath, it's in there. It's in many of those. It's uh, that those articles are in many of those booklets that are back over there. The photocopied proof that yes, that they admit that they changed these things. Well, how do you? How did you have the authority? By the very fact that we did it, because we did it. Nobody stood up and nobody complained that we did it. You know why nobody stood up and complained that they changed the laws? Because the people that stood up against it and complained and told them that they were wrong, they were killed. They were gotten out of the way. But the Catholic Church, they changed the laws by the means of deception. And they persuaded all religions and governments to turn from the keeping of Yahweh's laws, just like it's written there in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. It's the same thing over and over. It continues in the churches today. Nothing's changed from that time. The message is the same. Has Yahweh indeed said you need to keep those laws? You don't need to keep those laws. You don't have to do all of that. You're going to live forever. You have an immortal soul. What are they teaching in the churches down on the corner? You don't have to keep those old laws. Don't you know you have an immortal soul? The same thing. The teachings are the same. But the end result, the end result is the same. The end result is still going to be the same. The end result is going to be death. But to a certain extent, sexual sins were taught taught against up until the 1940s. Therefore, the earth was not as defiled then as it was today. Then the defilement started started increasing when television was invented. When television was invented and introduced into all homes, and Hollywood became the teacher of the world. Since that time, sexual sins have increased, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, sodomy, and even bestiality. All of those things have increased. And we've talked about this one before, too. Ah, there we go. See if I can... Okay. So we're talking about the... You're talking about the entertainment industry. You're talking about television... And you can see here that one of the major influences in the world today is the entertainment industry. There's probably not a house, well, I take that back. There's probably several houses here in in Yahweh's house that have no television. But out in the world, there are houses that have multiple televisions, three and four, and they 70, 80, 90 inches. They'll take up an entire wall, whatever it is, whatever they want to project, you know, whatever they want to fill their minds with, you know, they're going to have it right there and they'll have it in every room. But we see here that the, that the National Film Review Office, uh, Pope Pius the, my Roman numerals aren't that decent, 11, wrote Pope Pius the 11th in 1922 established the National Film Review Office. So in 1964, Pope Paul VI stated that, the church, that it is the church's birthright. This is, what, this is from one of the encyclicals that the Pope wrote. In uh, 1964, Pope, uh, Pope Paul VI stated that it's the church's birthright to use and own the press, the cinema, radio, TV, and others of a like nature. He cited special responsibility for the proper use, and this is their use, the proper use of the means of social communication, which, re- which rests on journalists, writers, actors, designers, producers, exhibitors, distributors, operators, sellers, critics, and all those who are, in a word, involved in making in the transmission of communications in any form or any way whatsoever. Now notice the power. Notice the power that this industry has. They have the power to direct mankind along, and I'm going to use their words here, along a good path or an evil path by the information they impart and the pressure they exert. It will be for them to regulate the economic, political, art and artistic values in a way that will not conflict with the common good, as they put it. In other words, Hollywood, 
the church is going to use Hollywood to mold the people into what they want them to be. And what do we see coming forth from the gods of Hollywood? You know, you look at the you look at the at the at the foolishness that comes from there. At what they're promoting, they're promoting these sexual sins, and and this here, you know, you know, illicit sexual relations of all kind and sin in general, it's being normalized in the in society today through the powerful influences that exist in the world, and the, and so and social media is one. You know, social media through you know through through the 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 social media means that are in existence on. Every smartphone, every computer, every tablet, you know, uh, not to mention, not to mention the television, but this in part comes, you know, in large part comes from the entertainment media, radio, television, etc., which pushes iniquity. And that's what they do. They push iniquity. The more exposure a person has or, or uh, a person or society has with a certain thing, the more desensitized and the behavior is considered a new normal. The more a person is exposed to violence, the more a person is exposed to immoral behavior, that becomes normal. That becomes normal for them. And this is what the industry, this is what entertainment, this is the danger in partaking in this entertainment does. It causes these things to be, it, it makes these things appear as they're normal. Entertainment was, entertainment was created for the sole purpose of getting people to stop studying the scriptures. To stop people from reading. Men, what's easier? Is it easier to sit down and, uh, and, and, to, and, and, and to watch a sermon? Or is it easier to sit down and crack open the book of Yisrael? Or to crack open the book of Yahweh and start reading yourself? Which one takes more effort? Praise Yahweh, cracking that book open. Okay? And Hollywood knew this, the, the church knew this, and they saw how the entertainment industry could be used to teach and to mold society, mankind, into what they wanted. And remember what Satan's, her whole thing, her, her whole goal is to destroy mankind. So she's doing it through the minds. She's doing it through the way that she's, that what people are allowing into their mind. And she's also doing it from another route. She's doing it from attacking the food supply. So this is what we have to guard. We have to be on guard, men, of what goes into our minds. We have to watch out for that. We have to guard our mind with all diligence. We have to guard ourselves 24 hours a day from these influences that are out there. We have to guard and be careful with the with the food and stuff that we get, you know, praise Yahweh that we have the cleanest food on the face of the earth coming forth right from here. You're not going to find it any cleaner anywhere else than where we're getting it right here. But Pastor shows here he said you know he, and he shows that each he says each time a law is broken. Now think about this: each time a law is broken, a defilement is created. A defilement is created. Every time, each time a law is broken, a sin continues, the defilements continue to be created and mixed and mutated and multiplied. Okay? We're supposed to be getting that stuff out of us. You know, the world keeps adding it to themselves. And if you take a look in your interactions with the world, I bet you can see the, 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 their, their mindset. Everything about, about what goes on in the world is just deteriorating. We see it with the news. But you see, AIDS is turning into a kingdom of killers. It's capable of associating with many different microorganisms, which the scripture refers to as the things with which the earth creeps, breeding and mixing with them, and making them helpers in the kingdom of HIV and AIDS. And Pastor Shows says, with all of this in mind, carefully read the following articles. You know, so this, is, this actually shows how what we just saw here and how these things combine and what they actually do to the body. Because people with AIDS have weakened immune systems, they're more prone to infections called opportunistic infections. 
Now, opportunistic infections are caused by organisms that typically don't cause disease in healthy people, but they affect people with damaged immune systems. And these organisms attack when there's an opportunity to infect. Okay? Remember how Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom she may devour? When a lion is out wandering, when she's out looking, when she's on the prowl, when she's looking for a kill, is she looking for the strongest that she can find? Is she looking for a challenge? Or is she looking for a quick, easy meal? Quick, easy meal. Well, that's what these opportunistic infections do. They take opportunity. Now, they take opportunity of what's weakened, and they use that as a door to get in and infect, and to get in and multiply. And eventually the body becomes overwhelmed, and it can't deal with these things. And it shows here, this article shows many opportunistic infections associated with AIDS cause serious illnesses. Some may be prevented, they say, and below is a list of infections and how they infect the body. Um, the first one here, it affects the eyes, it's called uh, cytomegalovirus. And, it's, uh, and I, 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 it's, it's related to the herpes virus. Okay, it's related to herpes. And uh, the natural, the, the hosts for this is human hosts and monkey hosts. So what that's tell, what, what, it, what, what Pastor told us, that's telling you that this thing's part monkey and part human, right? That's how it's able to infect the human. That's, how, that's why it's able to infect both, because it's part both. You see these things that affect the gastrointestinal tract, uh, uh, this uh, cryptosporiosis. Uh, 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 and a lot of these, are, they're, they're like parasites. I mean, they're parasites, and they're spread through, con, uh, through, contaminated, spread through contaminated foods. Okay? And a lot of these foods are spread through the oral fecal route, and basically what that comes from is people, and, and Pastor talks about, he's talked about it before, but it's talking about people not disposing of waste properly. Just dumping it out on the ground, dumping it in the water, just, just dumping it here, there, wherever they want to. Not properly disposing of waste. And a lot of these parasites, that's how they're spread. And we're warned and we're cautioned. And Pastor, you know, Pastor has said, well, the, the things we, that we get, that we pull out of the ground, we better be kosher in those things. Better be washing them up. Better be letting them soak, soak in salt water, lye water, whatever, before we eat them. Because that is our protection. That obedience is our protection from getting these things. Obedience is the key. And then you see some of these others here that affect the, affect the, the genitals. You see herpes con, uh, you see this herpes simplex, and then you see this HPV or human papillomavirus. And the thing about HPV, it's one of the most common STIs in the world today. And it shows here, let me see, I don't, I don't think I have, I don't think I have it there, but it shows uh, 79 million, uh, there's like 79 million Americans that are, um, that are affected with this virus. And the target, the, the, the area of the most infection seems to be the late teens, the early 20s. And, you know, it's a sexually transmitted disease, it's a sexually transmitted infection. And what's their solution? They say, don't engage in these illicit acts? Is that what they say to do? Nope. What do they say to do? Go get a shot. Or go get a series of three of them. And the thing that they tell you about the, you know, the things that they, that they say about this, and I looked up, there's one. And it shows here that says, uh, it says that uh, this particular, this particular, um, this particular vaccine is used both in males and females, and they say uh, it's, a, it's used in girls and young women ages 9 through 26 is when they suggest that they start getting this. A nine-year-old, ages 9 to 26, to prevent these, these, these cancers and these, these different cancers that you can see there. And it's also used in boys and young men ages 9 through 26. Notice what kind of cancer that's, that they're targeting to prevent that. Why aren't they just saying, 
Don't engage in that behavior. Don't engage in that behavior. You won't get it. Because there's no money in, to, in abstinence. There's no money. There's nothing, there's nothing to gain financially from saying, abstain from that. Don't do it. But notice, this particular vaccine, notice it only, it only prevents diseases caused by HPV type 6, 11, 16, and 18. It's pretty sad that they not only have a name for it, but they have different types. And there's four types. And it says it will not prevent uh, uh, that last underlying part there says, like any vaccine, it may not provide, uh, it may not, uh, provide protection from disease in every person. They've got to throw that disclaimer down there. Uh, it may not work for everybody. But there are, I looked it up, there are about 140 different types of this disease of HPV. And so by taking this vaccine, I guess you're hoping that you're going to come in contact with one of the four. I didn't figure out, I didn't, I didn't figure out what the statistics were on that, you know, on, on what the percentage is, you know, based on, you know, you know, based on what this might protect against and how many different strains are out there, but it's a, it's a, pretty minimal risk or a pretty minimal uh, margin of protection uh, of pseudo protection I guess you could say but continuing on and, and then another cause that comes from HIV another thing that is uh, that it affects is liver disease and one of the leading causes of death among AIDS patients and the sorceries that are in the world people run to the sorceries. They run to the pharmacist. They run to, oh, give me a pill for this. Give me a shot for this. Give me something to prevent this or give me something to take these symptoms away or to fix what I did to myself so that I can continue going on in my sin. That's what they want. A lot of these fixes that they have adversely affect the liver. You have to have liver monitoring because of the damage, potential damage that can be done to the liver. Anybody have any idea how important the liver is to your body? The different types of things that your liver does? I'm not going to go through all of them here. Let's see if I can go down one more on that maybe a little bit. Okay. One of the things the liver does is it eliminates toxins from the body. It acts as a filter. It, it's, it's, you're constantly, you know, we have, we're having, we have toxins coming in from the environment, from, from food. And this article showed that was from medications and from other sources. But it's constantly cleaning things up. Okay? And that's what it does. It's a filter. It cleans the body. It cleans the toxins out. The other thing it does is it processes nutrients. Did you know that it was the, that the liver actually uh, is a main function uh, from a digestive standpoint is to process the nutrients that come in from the small intestine? It's involved with distributing what you eat to the rest of your body. It also stores. It actually it adds it acts as a storage facility for the excessive nutrients, and then when the body needs it, it sends it out. It's vital for blood sugar control. Who would have thought that the liver was involved in controlling our, controlling our blood sugar? But the liver is key in regulating blood glucose, and it acts as the body's glucose reservoir to help keep your, uh, your circulating blood sugar levels and other body fuels steady and constant. Then when it runs, when it runs low, that triggers the stores to be released, and then that's how you, it maintains those levels. Cholesterol, it actually produces cholesterol. Cholesterol, is a ne it's necessary for the body. Every cell, from what I've, heard, what I've read, every cell in your body has cholesterol in it. If your cells didn't have cholesterol in it, you would die. You wouldn't live. 
but it balances cholesterol levels and that means it produces it and it helps clean it out, it keeps it balanced. It synthesizes proteins, amino acids, and it plays a role in breaking down the proteins during digestion. And uh, it, it metabolizes, it helps metabolize these, the, these proteins and makes, helps it make amino acids. It, uh, it makes bile, which is, which is used in the di digestion of fat. Fat is necessary. The brain has to have fat. It uses fat. You know, fats are very, you know, fats are beneficial, are definitely beneficial. And uh, let me see here, what the fats, what else, it, what else does it do? Okay. And the bile also assists with the elimination of toxins from the body. Okay. But this is produced by the liver. Okay. It aids in immunity. Liver is an, act, is an organ of the immune system. It's part of the immune system. Due to something called, they call them Kupfer, Kupfer cells. And they capture and digest bacteria, fungi, parasites, worn out blood cells, and cellular debris. And, you know, it filters those things out. So it protects the body. And the thing about, the, the thing about it is the liver can produce, and it can, it can, uh, it can process a large volume, uh, large volumes of blood daily. And it shows there, in addition, the large volume of blood passing through the hepatic portal system, the veins leading to the liver, and the liver itself allow these cells to clean large volumes of blood at very quickly. Okay? It helps with blood clotting. The liver helps with blood clotting? Well, it's responsible for, for producing the, coagul uh, the coagulants, the coagulation factors. Some of these... Um, uh, so some of these factors require vitamin K for synthesis. And, and, and the liver produces bile, uh, the, the bile salts essential for intestinal absorption, absorption of this fat soluble vitamin, so vitamin K. You know, it's absorbed with the help of the liver. It promotes new blood cells. It, it, it breaks down the old and it breaks them down into their basic requirement and their basic buildup, their basic building blocks and their basic components. And it sends them to other parts of the bodies where they're stored until they're used to make blood more blood cells. You know, it's just like the microorganisms in the soil. These microorganisms, you know, in the liver, they're doing the same thing. It's breaking down the old and, and breaking it down to those basic parts, sending it to where it's stored until it needs to be used, and then it's used to rebuild and regenerate. And it does the same thing over and over and over. And then finally it shows here that the liver is unique that like the skin, it can grow back when it's been damaged. You know, the liver can be damaged, but what we're putting into it, these medications, you think about it, the sorceries, these things, they attack the liver. That's why when you have to, when, when you're on certain medication, all you need to come in once a month, we gotta check your liver enzymes to make sure we're not damaging your liver. Now that you know, now that we know how important and how wonderfully made this liver, you know, this, this one organ that Yahweh created. Are we going to be willing to risk damaging that? You damage the liver, you're, you're going to die. People with end-stage liver disease, they die. It gets to the point where the liver, where it can't regenerate, it can't repair itself. And if it can't do that, then there's no, you know, there's no, there, there's absolutely, there's no bringing it back. Then you see the lungs, the HIV infections, they, they affect, infect the lungs. They, they get a, uh, they'll get a fungus in the lungs, tuberculosis. Uh, a, tuberculosis is a bacterial infection, and it can be deadly. Uh, candidiasis is the mostly, is the most common HIV-related, it's a fungal infection. It can retire, it can infect the entire body, but most commonly occurs in the mouth. It's an overgrowth of yeast that causes white patches on the gums or tongue or the lining of the mouth. It causes pain, difficulty in swelling, and loss of appetite. And again, also there you have herpes simplex. Okay, but all of these things, you know, all of these things are, are these infections that are associated with AIDS. Then on page 110, we see an alarming raise an alarming rise in HIV AIDS cases in Bihar. Now Bihar is in, I had to look up and see where that was. That's in India. 
just to kind of show you there. It's in the northeastern part of India, right there. But this is where, but this is the alarming raise in AIDS and cases in Bihar. It says there's been an alarming ri uh, rise in HIV AIDS uh, cases in, in, in Bihar, I think that's how you pronounce it, during the past six years, even as the state government has spent scores of rupees to contain the deadly disease. According to the report, the number of HIV positive patients rose to 4,254 uh, during 2006 2007, as against the 2,786 from 2005 to 2006. So it almost doubled in a year's, in a year's time. It almost doubled. In 2001, 2002, only seven HIV AIDS cases were detected in the state while it went up to 348, 2002 to 2003, 812, 2003 to 2004, and 824, 2004 to 2005. So you can see the jumps, the jumps that it's taking there. Common birds hit but hit hard by West Nile virus. Disease can be blamed for the decline of crows, blue jays, robins, wrens, chickadees, and bluebirds. The West Nile virus has had a devastating impact on bird population, killing hundreds of blue jays, crows, a study, and crows a study has found. The U.S. study published today, uh, today in the Journal of Na uh, Nature says the virus transmitted through the bite of an infected mosquito and believed to have arrived in North America in 1999 has not only infected more than 21,000 people in Canada and the United States, but is the culprit in the decline of seven common bird species. Now, it doesn't say when this, uh, it doesn't say when this article was written here. But it says, uh, but it shows here, it says, the chickadee population was 68% below expected levels in 2005. Eastern bluebirds and American robins were 52% and 32% below. The American crow was hit hardest, losing 45% of its numbers across the United States. And Dr. Liddell said that crows may be seen as nuisances, but they also clean up animal carcasses and regulate other bird populations by being predators. If you take out the crows, are we going to see, you know, are we going to see more rates, it says. I mean, are they, you know, what, with a decrease in the crow population in doing what they're designed to do, how is that offset? What's that going to do to everything else? Dr. Liddell said it's not, it is not known how severe the impact of the virus has been on rare birds and the birds of prey, such as the owl, hawk, and eagle, because there's no survey that monitors them. So they don't know how some of these others are affected, because there's no, there's no surveys, they're not monitoring. But the same mixture that is affecting mankind can also affect the birds and the bees. Avian flu, the next pandemic. It's one of the 16 varieties of avian influenza or bird flu. American researchers now say that the deadly H5N1 form of bird flu has split into two distinct strains. So it mutated, it changed, and now it's split out into two. Antiviral drugs like Tamiflu and Relenza have to be taken within 48 hours of getting the flu. Killing millions of birds has not eliminated the threat to people from the avian flu. So even though you had these millions of birds that were, uh, uh, that, that were culled or that were eliminated, people were still getting the flu, the bird flu. Why? Because it was being transmitted from person to person. Indonesia 2005, a man and his, daughters, and his two daughters die of H5N1, although none of them worked around poultry. The World Health Organization says it cannot rule out the possibility of human-to-human -human transmission of avian flu in these cases. Okay? The World Health Organization is paying particular attention to H5N1 for several reasons. And look at, look at, what, look at what the virus does. It mutates rapidly and now has a history of being able to acquire genes from viruses infecting other animal species. Okay. It changes, and not only mutates, but it mutates rapidly and is taking on these characteristics and, and, and changing itself into new strains. It has caused severe disease in humans. It isolates, it, uh, laboratory studies have demonstrated that, demonstrated that isolates from the virus have a high pathogenicity and can cause severe disease in humans. Okay. Remember, in order to do that, it's got to be part human, right? Birds that survive infection excrete the virus for at least 10 days, making it easier to spread the virus at live poultry markets and by migratory birds. 
the symptoms of avian flu now, and, 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 it's, uh, and, past, and it shows here, it says, notice how closely these relate to AIDS. Same, similar symptoms, fever, fatigue, cough, sore throat, eye infections, muscle aches. Very, very similar. The World Health Organization says the epidemic in birds caused by H5N1, which started in December 2003 in Korea, has spread to other countries. More infected birds increases the opportunities for direct infection to humans. If more humans become infected, the World Health Organization says the odds also increase that humans, if they're infected with human and avian influenza strains at the same time, could serve as a mixing vessel. They do serve as a mixing vessel for a mutated virus that spreads easily from person to person, and that would mark the start of a flu pandemic. Now notice what this doctor says. What worries me most is the ignorance of people in the public who assume that if they get sick, there will be something there for them, and they don't realize, how the, they don't realize the, st the devastation that this could be. You think about the mindset of the people in the world. Oh, if I get sick, what am I going to do? I'm going to run to the doctor. I'm going to get a shot. I'm going to go get a pill. I'm going to get something to take this away. So I'm not going to be worried if I go out and do this and I catch this disease. And this doctor, she saw, this individual saw it, the ignorance of people in the public that assume that there's things that are going to work. Are the doctors going to tell you it isn't going to work? No. The drug companies aren't going to tell you it isn't going to work. They're going to say, well, go ahead and try it. Because then their product is being used. You know, and they know, and they have to know that it's not, that they have to know that these things are not effective in what, they, in what they say that they will do. The virus has gained the ability to infect a large number of hosts, not only the chickens that it normally infects, but tigers, cats, and transmitted to humans. And there's some evidence that, it's re, that it is refining its genes, just like AIDS, if you will. It says in, Feb in uh, the second Roman month, 2004, another strain of avian influenza, H7N3, swept through British Columbia's poultry industry. The province ordered more than 17 million birds killed. It took six months for the province to be declared free of avian flu. The outbreak was so devastating to the poultry industry. There were also two documented cases in people who showed mild influenza illnesses and eye infections. Notice this next paragraph, the next two, a couple of paragraphs here. It says, there are few warning signs before a pandemic strikes. It says there's few warning signs. There are, few, there, there are few warning signs before a pandemic strikes except a large and rapidly growing number of new and unrelated cases every day. That's what they're going to see. The World Health Organization says in the best case scenario, two to seven million people will die in the next pandemic and tens of millions will need medical attention. But if the virus is particularly virulent, in other words, if it's particularly deadly, the number of deaths could be dramatically higher. The organization warns that a, the global spread of a pandemic can't be stopped, but preparing properly will reduce its impact. You know, you think about with the increase in, in, in knowledge, the increase in technology in these last days. You can be halfway around the world. You could, be from, you could leave here and be halfway around the world in 18 hours or less. A person that's infected here could carry that infection on that plane. In that plane, you're in a sealed cabin. That sealed cabin is doing what? It's recirculating air. And that air is being breathed in and out by every single person on that aircraft. So now guess what? Everybody on that airplane has been exposed. And it's potentially a carrier. So you can see how this stuff can spread. Again, I say it sounds like AIDS. The following information has shown that the honeybees, that the honeybees are developing AIDS-like symptoms. It talks about under the weather bees. It says, when I, when I first got this assignment to do a story on dead honeybees, I was intrigued and curious, not just about, what they were, about why they were dying, but why people would care. 
You know, why are people caring about these, about these, these, these bees dying? What he didn't know, what this reporter didn't know, is that bees pollinate more than flowers. They're, they're, uh, they're partially responsible for one out of every three bites of food the American average American eats. Scientists are reporting the dramatic loss of honeybee colonies. Some beekeepers say that they're losing 20% of their bees. Others say half, and some say 80%. And they're opening the hives to find that the bees are dead or gone. And this professor of entomology at Penn State University, she says that the die-off, die-off is, this die-off is unprecedented. The normally resilient bees she dissected showed traces of not one or two diseases, but nearly every disease known to affect them over the past century. So it's not just one disease she's seeing, not two, but almost every known disease to affect them over the past century, over the past hundred years, that they have these things. They had all of the diseases at once, a sign that their immune systems have been compromised. Sounds like AIDS, sounds like B-AIDS. She says it is in a way. AIDS in humans is caused by HIV, and we don't have anything like that yet, but we're seeing something very similar in the terms of B-AIDS here. The bees are immunocompromised, being stressed somehow. And we see the same thing here in this next article here, what's killing billions of bees? There's something very strange taking place to America's bees, honeybees in particular, and they're vanishing by the billions. Considering how vital they are to our crops and to our food supply, unraveling the mystery has became, become a top priority. Congress is holding hearings. Even the vice president has been briefed. Okay, and so this is a transcript. This is a transcript from CNN. And what they're doing is what they show us is, so they opened up a beehive, and she says, it was an empty box, there's no bees. And they said, and this, uh, the bees are gone and presumed dead, but there's no corpses and no clues. Hackenberg believes that he's lost more than 2,000 hives with about 40,000 bees per hive. That's 80 million bees that are gone from that one operation. No dead bees on the ground, no bees anywhere. The billions of honeybees in more than 25 states and five Canadian provinces have simply vanished. And there's more than just honey at stake for all, of the, uh, for all of us. The USDA estimates that bees contribute $15 billion to U.S. agriculture each year. We get an astonishing 30% of our food from plants pollinated by honeybees. Crops like almonds, apples, blueberries, and broccoli wouldn't grow without them. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of all of the bees in the United States disappeared last year. You know we're talking about a, a serious situation. Serious enough for scientists to give this bizarre syndrome a name and they call it colony collapse disorder. And this colony collapse disorder uh, appears to be throwing off the bees' homing skills. They can't find their way home, so they die. They can't find their way back. They go out, but they can't find their way back. It's like their GPS satellite, their, their satellite has gone out, their GPS has gone out. They've lost their way. They can't get home. And when they can't find their way home, they die. And without them, the queen and the babies die too. The impact of how quickly these colonies are dying, and there's some evidence and some decent evidence to suggest that there there is a pathogen involved. And it said in some some of the bees, at least five different diseases have been discovered, which suggests that their immune system has been broken down or completely gone haywire, something similar to what happens in humans who have AIDS. And it says, this could, that said, uh, honeybee specialist Marion Fraser says, even trace amounts of an insecticide could be lethal. And it could interfere with their ability to learn to, navig- uh, to learn or to navigate. And this is well documented that pesticides have these kind of effects. Whatever it is, more bees are disappearing every month. And, this, uh, and Dave Heckelberg's hives tell them that there isn't much time left. So, you know, you can see how these things are spreading. It's not affecting just humans, but it is. It's, a, it's another way. It's another attack you know, on the food supply, how these diseases are adversely affecting the food supply. And men, this is what we're going to be guarding against. This is what we're training for. We're training to to guard and protect and to keep things like this from ever taking place again.